Thank you very much indeed, Mike. Uh, I, I see that uh, you must have been studying the, the, the internet for my biography. Um, <laughs> indeed. Linked, LinkedIn is a great site. That's a, it is good. Um, and uh, you've also done all the stuff I was going to say uh, about damp as well, but uh, at, at the beginning. So that's, um, that's great. We shall push straight on. Uh, the first thing I would like to say, though, is that I've, I have probably got the title incorrect. Um, in fact, I, I know I have. It, it says late 18th century and early 19th century Kukubri maps. There are more than what I'm going to talk about, um, but I'm going to feature mainly uh, just two specific ones. But we'll, we'll build into the, the maps uh, kind of slowly, just to give you an idea of how mapping was going on over the 18th century. I only came across this map uh, fairly recently. It's by John Cowley and done in uh, 1734. The full title of it uh, goes, a display of the coasting lines of six several maps of North Britain showing the disagreement between geographers in their representations of the extent and situation of the country. The, the long and the short is that the geographers didn't know where Scotland exactly was. And uh, here we have it. There are six um, maps, one on top of each other here, and all at different longitudes and latitudes. The six that he had chosen were John D Adair, Herman Moll, Gordon of Straloch. He was the one that put together um, Pont and Blau together um, for the maps that we know very well. Uh, John Senex, an Englishman, and uh, Charles Insulin and Nicholas Sanson, who, who are both French. Now... There was uh, a feeling amongst the intelligentsia of the time uh, that this was awful, that mapping should be better. And I give you that just simply to uh, demonstrate how poor things were. And then as we move on, you'll see how much better uh, they got in, as it were, a mere 70 years. And uh, Scotland actually was at the forefront of mapping at by the end of that period. Um, right, we'll move straight on. The estate maps themselves are always a bit of a conundrum. And between you and me, some of them are actually really quite boring. Um, they're statements, if you like, of, of uh, fact and position. So if you look at the bottom left, for instance, which is uh, of Earlston and the farms around Earlston just by Dalry, um, you have great blank expanses shown here. And the farms, you can just right. see them, and uh, but there are no roads. So you don't actually know what else uh -huh. is going on and how the relationship it's, is so between one farm green. and another. It's got a green tech at it. So um, the speakers, they've got a tech I think, I think uh, someone's on the telephone. <laughs> on the top there, there's uh, a, a different map. That, that one, incidentally, was done by a John Gregg in about 1769. Um, it's fairly rough and ready, but shows you the relationship between one farm and another. Above there is Airds, um, which is part of the Coconnell estate down in New Abbey. Now, even this map, it shows yeah, you trees again. and it shows you fencing, but it doesn't show you much more than that. In the middle, sort of nearing the top, you can see the farm, which is Aird's. But you, again, you don't really see any roads. Um, the fencing has been scrawled out by somebody with a big red pen. And the fascinating thing about this particular map for me is actually the red writing, uh, because... This is, was done in 1863. The map itself was done by John Lewis. He was a drinking buddy of, of uh, Robert Burns. And 
uh, the Lewis map here was done in 1814 and obviously done in Scott's Acres. And somebody in 1863 has come along with a big red pen and crossed all the numbers out and put in Imperial Acres instead. Um, on the right hand side, uh, we see a, a, a legal map. It's about the um, mapping of um, a, a march between Del Swinton Estate and somewhere else. And that is its sole purpose. So there's no agricultural improvements that are shown in these maps at all. And we can't actually see particularly anything um, going from one state to another, except perhaps those fences on the top map, which have been scored out and other ones put in. So let's go on to uh, our maps. The two that I'm going to focus on. There's uh, one here. Um, uh, they're both by John Gillen. And this one is down at the bottom of Borg Parish. And down at the bottom there, you'll see uh, Little uh, Ross Island. And uh, you have Brig House on the left. And you have what is now Ross Bay, but was Balmangan Bay at those in those times. Uh, it's a terrific map because of the detail that um, uh, the cartographer explores the, um, the whole. Uh, he stuck ev absolutely everything in. It's as though somebody came to him and said, don't leave anything out. And that's exactly what he's done. If we go to the top, we see that it's been done by the Earl of Selkirk. Now, we haven't got a date for this map, which is a, a real pity. But uh, consensus amongst dampers is that it's actually middle to late um, 80, uh, 1780s. Uh, we think this is the case because Lord Dare took over from his father, the Earl of Selkirk. Um, uh, he took over the running of the estate in 86, 1786. This is a fairly plain cartouche. Uh, we can see John Gillen's name down at the bottom, but there's no real folder rolls on it at all. We know also that the Earl of Selkirk and his son, Lord Dare, were not folk for folder rolls. Uh, they were almost embarrassed by their title. And in fact, they were probably, um, possibly even Republican in their political leanings. We'll just uh, go on. The other map that I want to have a look at is this one. This is the, the borough map of the lands of Borland that belong to Kukubri town. Uh, this is a stunning piece of work. Again, the detail is immense. There's all sorts of things that are in there that wouldn't be on those other maps that we had looked at earlier. The wonderful part of it is, for me as well, is the cartouche. And in the last week or two, I've been spending some time staring at these maps. And every time I have a look, there's always something new that uh, crops up. Lord Dare was born in 1763. And he died, in fact, in 1794, in November 1794. This map has been put together and finished in April 1795, so just a few months after the death of Lord Dare. Lord Dare was also the Lord Provost of Kokubri, and quite frankly, everybody was uh, really sad to see him uh, uh, die at that particular moment. Um, when he did die, James D.L., the Lord Provost in this 
um, uh, Cartouche, and in uh, 1795, who followed on from Dare, um, immediately had the magistrate's seats, the pulpit, and the precentor's desk in the kirk covered in black cloth. They also officially recorded uh, in the council minutes the sincere respect they and all the community justly have for his lordship's memory. And what we have here is actually a continuation of that morning. And extraordinarily, down at the bottom around the, uh, the seal of Kukubri are black cloths enfolding the, um, the seal. Just up above the seal, we can see the uh, palm fronds, which in uh, funerary terms uh, were to do with resurrection and with peace. And at the top of this extraordinary cartouche, we have a funerary urn, a classic funerary urn. So what this is, is a gravestone, if you like, to Lord Dare, which is an extraordinary thing to find on a map. And it gives Dare, if you like, a presence here, um, even though he's, he's no longer um, with the council. And I, I find this particularly wonderful. Okay, who was Lord Basil William Dare? Well, there's actually remarkably little that's written about him. One of the big problems is that uh, there was a fire in uh, St. Mary's Isle in uh, uh, the 1940s. Uh, incidentally, does anybody know when it, it, when it actually was? Because I've had four different dates given to me. Um, I think 1940, 1941, 1948, and 1949. So it would be interesting to know which it was, to see if I can find a newspaper report. Uh, these uh, pictures, the one on the left and the one on the right, they are, we know, supposed to be of Lord Dare. The one on the left I find particularly funny uh, because, uh, like his father, they, prob and they probably didn't have time to go and um, get their portrait and sit for their portrait. And John Brown was renowned, who did the picture on the left, was renowned for uh, doing portraits in an hour-long sitting. And I suspect that this is what this one is, done in 1784, um, when uh, Lord Dare was a student. The picture in the middle, I'm afraid, is also by John Brown, but it's of, uh, according to the subscript of it, uh, an unknown man. And uh, I just thought that it looked like the Lord Dare on the left. And it could conceivably be possibly that it, that it was him. But neither the, the, if you look at the picture on the left and the one on the right, they don't even look like each other. So what sort of a man was he? Which is uh, really the um, big question. Um, he liked helping folk out, and he was uh, very much one for the public good. And that is why he was so beloved by the council and the town council um, uh, when, and it was shown when he actually died. Um, what we do know is that he had lots of uh, various correspondence, if you like. And uh, here are some of them. I've done a kind of a mishmash of different ones. But the leading guy here is, is Adam Smith. And we all know Adam Smith because of his wealth of nations. And it was a text that everybody would have read when they were at university. And it was published in different languages across Europe. And so it was, it was a very well-known book. But the Selkirk family actually knew Adam Smith. And they um, uh, did actually um, uh, talk together and um, meet each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Dougal Stewart was the professor of moral philosophy at Edinburgh University when Dare was there. And it happened that Dare lodged at uh, Dougal Stewart's um, house. And uh, so a lot will have rubbed off. Dougal Stewart was a particular fan of Adam Smith as well. So I'm quite sure that if uh, Dare had read The Wealth of Nations once, he had probably read it six times, I would imagine. Uh, the connectedness of all these people um, up in Edinburgh and uh, of the, the Scots intelligentsia, if you like, um, is uh, probably shown best um, when Adam Smith died, his uh, friends decided to uh, bring out a third edition of his theory of moral sentiments. And Dougal Stewart wrote the introduction. James Hutton, the, geo the great geologist, um, and uh, Joseph Black uh, were the editors of that particular edition. Now, Joseph Black was actually Dare's uh, chemistry professor. That was his line of um, work. And uh, it was him that actually discovered, if you like, latent heat. And also, uh, I think it was carbon dioxide. And uh, he was responsible uh, for the starting of the whole field of thermo thermodynamics. So all these guys were interconnected. And we know that Dougal Stewart, for instance, went uh, with um, Dare to Paris on at least a couple of occasions when he was at university. Um, and uh, I think it was Adam Smith, Dougal Stewart, and James Hutton who proposed the Earl of Selkirk to join uh, the uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh. So they were all talking to each other, and he was in that particular group. Now, there are two strands of that group. There's a political strand and a scientific one. And we'll just have a quick look at that before we press on with maps. The political one, you find that Dare was nattering to Republicans in France, um, specifically when he was there in 1791. Um, and he was there when the um, uh, King of France uh, decided to uh, run off and had to be returned back to Paris again. And uh, republicanism suddenly uh, broke out then. And these were some of the leading figures within that um, group. And Brissot specifically, um, uh, I think he was uh, actually led for a time the nationalist, first National Assembly in France. Um, incidentally, Condorcet and, and Brissot landed up uh, in, uh, under the guillotine. Rodera kind of defected to, Napoleon, uh, to uh, Napoleon and uh, escaped that fate. They were the political strand, and here is the scientific. Now, Lavoisier was, if you like, Joseph Black's um, uh, French half. Uh, he it was that discovered things like, um, uh, things we take for granted now, oxygen, hydrogen. And in the bottom left, you see him uh, talking to, um, or organizing his laboratory with his wife on the right-hand side, taking notes. And uh, the poor gentleman sitting at the table um, being uh, filled with some form of gas, we know not what, and being uh, tested as a result. And on the top there, something that looks almost steampunk, um, uh, here we have the um, solar furnace. And uh, it was, I won't go into all the uh, chemistry stuff, mainly because I haven't got a clue what it was all about. Um, but uh, this was uh, one of his mechanisms that Lavoisier did. 
he was very much a man who was after Dare's heart. He was uh, thinking about other people. He was looking at uh, prison reform. Um, he uh, uh, was a humanitarian, basically, and he also worked on things like uh, water and air quality for uh, Parisians. Um, he too met his end on the guillotine, and as the judge interrupted his defense, he said, um, well, the judge said, the Republic needs neither scholars nor chemists. The course of justice cannot be delayed. Um, i leave you with that kind of a thought. Now, he was also very much like Dare and his father, who supported things like pamphleteering and uh, the idea of trying to um, uh, develop uh, a full-scale uh, assault on the conservatism of the time. Um, and just very quickly, we think that that's a separate thing. Lavoisier, uh, Lavoisier in Paris doing all these fancy things. But then suddenly we get this. This is from Samuel Smith, 1794. And it is the statistical account, a note in the statistical account, um, very um, dodgy uh, science, I think. And um, I suspect that Dare and Lavoisier would have been cringing if they'd read it. Um, and uh, it was... Um, if you have a look, though, he does actually quote Lavoisier in um, just off center there, uh, down to the southeast, as it were. Um, you can see Lavoisier's name there. So it wasn't just about it being happening in Paris. It was also, if you like, things were happening in Kukubri. Kukubri, if you like, the center of the world or the intelligent world, shall we say. Now, going back onto the maps, how does that relate back to the maps? Well, we can see here the sort of detail that uh, came on. Uh, this is the one um, from uh, Mikkel Ross and uh, Brighouse. And you can see the detail here. We can see the rises in the ground, and we can see which is arable which is rough, which is bog, which is the meadow, and all that kind of thing. And that's what you would expect. He also marks things like the sheep rees and also the, the, the springs. So fairly mundane, common things. But then he also marks the stuff on the shoreline. A bold, rocky shore, but not perpendicular, etc., etc. Um uh, they are particularly um, uh, almost strange in the context of estate maps because uh, we don't see this on other um, work, even of, of Gillen's. Um, he also did, uh, uh, what were their names? Uh, Maxwell of Monreath's maps over in uh, Wigdenshire. And there's quite a lot of coastline there. When he gets the opportunity, he puts a boat in the sea, but there's nothing much more than that. And he's actually targeting the land rather than the sea. But it's very obvious from this that somebody had told him, put everything in. Uh, this is quite a nice one. Um, in the Balmangan Bay, which is now Ross Bay, um, road passable through the bay um, uh, at any low water it is. And uh, I find that a bit strange looking at it at first. And then I was looking at Ainsley's county map. Uh, and incidentally, this was also uh, produced by um, Dare. It came out in, in 1797. I see I've missed a figure off it. Um, uh, but it was commissioned in 1791, and it took that long for these things to uh, digest, get the money together, and all the rest of it. 
But here we see along Hinochenkern Bay, over by Rough Island, and down at Ardwall, down next door to Gatehouse, we see that there are roads all over the place within the sea, as it were, at low tide, which is something that we don't think about these days. And here we have uh, Gillen loved his boats. And uh, on this map, we see safe anchorages, boat havens, and even where it says White Bay down in the middle at the bottom, uh, you see that there's a double masted ship there that is um, uh, riding at anchor and perhaps waiting out a storm. And if you read uh, Webster's uh, work on the agriculture in Galloway, uh, there are notes in that that suggest that this was a favorite place um, to come and shelter uh, from the southwesterlies. Uh, if I knew my boats better, I could tell you more. This is one of my favorite vignettes of that whole map. It tells you a lot about believe it or not, the agriculture of the area. In Kukubri Bay and also down at places, another lovely shell bank is to be found down at Cass and Carry Fair uh, down at um, um, uh, near Newton Stewart, um, near Cretown. Uh, you get these shell banks in the Solway and they're fairly full of shell. And if you burn the shell, then it's good enough to stick on the fields and act as lime. And this is what these guys are doing here, is piling the shell up and throwing it in the boat. And then as the tide rises, they head off back up with the tide and probably up to Tongland and offload the shell at that point. And they'll do this all through the summer season um, in order to um, get fertilizer everywhere around and about, I should say. Incidentally, um, uh, the, uh, Sam Smith, who was the Minister of Borg and uh, uh, wrote the statist old statistical account for Borg, uh, he mentions that the whole uh, uh, parish there, um, instead of buying in lime, they got shell from the shell banks here. And finally, on this part, uh, at the bottom of this particular map, there is this ship, which uh, I find totally extraordinary. The flag at the back is actually an American flag. The guns are run out, which means that it's ready for action. And the consensus of opinion is that this is probably John Paul Jones's The Ranger um, coming round uh, just south of uh, Meikle Ross and running with the southwesterlies round and into Kukubri Bay to come and kidnap the Earl of Selkirk in uh, 1778. I think that uh, very definitely um, this may well be a depiction of that. It's not an accurate one. There aren't the correct number of guns and such like. But it shows that uh, we have, if you like, a notion of um, uh, Dare's sense of humor or even Selkirk's sense of humor in having this um, here. The other thing we've got to remember too is that uh, the War of Independence with America uh, was not seen at the time as a war of independence. It was seen as a revolution, as serious as the French Revolution. And so it was uh, treated as such. And uh, the idea was that uh, there were all sorts of ideas materializing from the, uh, both these revolutions and uh, Dare was in that mix. So in a sense, this ship 
represents all that on this map as well. On the bottom right there, you can see another ship with also with an American flag, which is also drawn by Gillen. Now that comes from, believe it or not, a map of Castle Douglas, um, which was done at a similar sort of time in the 1780s. Now, the reason for that flag there is because of the trading connections that um, uh, Douglas had with particularly with Virginia. Uh, and that was where he made his fortune. And also in that cartouche, there is also a small uh, uh, floret of tobacco as well. I should say as well here that uh, James D.L., who was the Lord Provost in 1795, um, his second son was also a merchant in New York. So we have all these connections with the wider world that Kukubri had at that point. I think, Mike, we were going to stop for some questions at this point. Yeah, I think we can do that. Um... So I think Helen's keeping a lookout for any uh, hands going up. But perhaps I can ask, does anyone know the date of the St. Mary's Isle uh, fire? They can unmute and maybe tell us. Oh, good thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to see who we got. Um... So can you see any um, hands going up, Helen? No. People nope. can also uh, use the chat function if they want to yeah. ask a question. Um, shall, we, shall we just push on? I think so. I don't appear to be any questions yet. So, yeah, let's push on. Okay. Um, I asked too quickly, obviously. Now, if we go to uh, the other map, uh, the one of the um, Borland. Um, uh, it is very similar in many uh, ways in the detail that's given. And there's three particular vignettes that I enjoy from it here. And these are the sorts of things that you might expect to find and um, also be handy to find on these maps. Um, a notion that you have a farmhouse and a farm, but also a nice big square barnyard on the left hand side. On the right hand side, you have a post house. Now, this is actually a very rare occasion where we actually see post houses um, uh, written in uh, on these maps at this time. And just to the um, uh, this is just below the, the bridge that goes over at Tongland, not the Telford Bridge, because this map predates the Telford Bridge. Um, but uh, it's the, the stables at, um, as well, just in that little vignette. The one below I enjoy as well. This is the Tongland port. So you have those wee boats with all the shell coming up to this particular place. And then it getting manufactured into something you can put on the ground and then uh, is uh, sent by cart onwards from there. Um, all these um, are not the sort of things that you see generally speaking on, on most of the maps that uh, we tend to get. Again, you get the feeling that somebody has said to the guys, make sure you stick everything onto it. One of the things we haven't talked about is uh, roads. Uh, in Scotland, when we think of roads, we think of um, uh, Telford, of course. And of course, you have the bridge just, um, just there. Um, and uh, after that, of course, it's, it's Macadam. And they developed road building in the UK and elsewhere um uh, along uh, very solid lines but what they built from was actually from this uh 
French guy, Pierre Trezeguet. I can't pronounce it, Mike. I really can't. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'll call him Pierre. I can manage that one. Uh, Pierre wrote a book in 1775 called Memoir sur la construction du chemin de la généralité de Limoges. Now, the Limoges, we will find out, actually is important. 1775 was also important because Pierre got to be uh, the boss man for roads in the whole of France. And uh, so his book uh, also became the thing uh, for building roads in France. The only problem was the French didn't have any money to spend on roads. And so they didn't get actually around to building roads according to his way of doing it until about the 1820s after the uh, Napoleonic Wars and everything else. And apparently the army really cut up the roads in France as well. Now, how does this uh, join up with Dare? Well, in 1791, uh, I discover that he was heading off to, believe it or not, Limoges. Now, it doesn't actually say specifically that he was um, uh, going off to see Rhodes, but uh, he, we do know that he had a great interest in the Rhodes. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, Adam Smith said that the best improvement anybody can make uh, is via um, the roads of the land and making them as good as possible. Um, so it seems that Dare um, did go and try and look at roads in Limoges. Uh, but uh, the other part of the equation is that he also talked to George Clark Maxwell, who had Drum Creef over at uh, uh, Moffat and also um, uh, a family estate at Middleby, et cetera, et cetera. And he was the, I think, great, great uncle or great, great grandfather of uh, the great uh, Clark Maxwell, the um, electricity man, James Clark Maxwell. And uh, they had discussions uh, about roads for sure, but I haven't kind of tracked down exactly what those discussions were. But I have a feeling that either George or uh, perhaps Dare himself had got a hold of uh, Pierre's book and uh, was uh, trying to uh, imitate what was written in there. And certainly some of the roads that uh, we see appear to be uh, similar. Uh, at this time as well, in in the when uh, Gillen was brought into the um, uh, uh, brought in by Dare to do work on the estate, uh, he was also brought in as the county surveyor, and uh, it was he and Dare who. Uh, engineered, if you like, the roads. Uh, we can see, and I get very confused with these, so please feel confused yourselves. Um, uh, the roads on these maps as to whether uh, it's the old one or the new one we're looking at. But what we can see is that there are roads on here, and this is the Balmangan, Brighouse and Michael Ross map. Um, there are roads on here that definitely overlay uh, some of the previous writing. On the left here, we can see um, several roads um, going down into the bay. And on the right, um, there's a new organization of roads and things are straightened out. Um, I think that the, the pink road on the left-hand side of the left map is the new road and it tends to take to the fields the arable fields which was always a no-no but in fact um, what they're doing is following a more easy route for carts so less uphill and downhill
similar things are happening here. We have old roads and new roads. It's much more easy to see. On the left-hand side, we have the, um, the map. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see where the, the road forks. And on the left-hand side is the new road that heads up to the new bridge, which is the Telford Bridge, which I think was finished in uh, 1808. Now, the other road, incidentally, is in on the right-hand side. It's actually used for the railway. Um, but that was the old road that headed up to the Tonglen Bridge higher up the river. Uh, this is the Barwinach estate up at Twynham. And again, we can see the various roads being changed. And all I'm really trying to show is the, is the roads being changed. I'm not going to tell you that that's the A392 or something. Um, <clears throat> because I will I will get in a complete fankle on this. Um, but what we see is the idea of a, a toll road coming in. And the toll roads were the turnpike roads, um, uh, which needed a, an act of parliament uh, in order to um, get them built. Um, Dare was instrumental in getting that act of parliament through. Um, but it didn't actually arrive, I don't think, until after his death. I like the bottom left vignette, where you've got a choice of of two roads um, coming down from the top. And uh, one is the new road, and the other one is the old road. But the one going across the middle is, of course, the, the, the military road, and uh, it wasn't the chosen uh, route that um, Dare had designed. It was Dare himself that planned all the roads. And even though he didn't see them getting um, done, it, most of them were done according to his plans. And more importantly, uh, to uh, Gillen's surveying. Uh, this map I enjoy very much. It's it's a little bit off piste for you guys, but it's uh, down near New Abbey. You can see New Abbey written on the uh, bottom of of this map, and you can see the ruins pictured on the right hand side. Now up the middle, you can see letters scrawled um, A B C D E F G. You can see. Now, this is uh, really fine surveying as far as John Gillen was concerned. Uh, and not only that, it was some of the, um, uh, the most upmarket surveying of roads that was being done in the country at the time. Uh, Dare's idea was that you should be trying to make the roads as smooth as possible. And that meant trying to take out as many as, uh, men, as many of the ups and downs, but also making sure that when you did have a slope, it was a smooth slope. And here's some of the notes on the same map. If we choose, um, let us say, um, the one bit where it says BC, and uh, I can't read it all, but it says from B to C, and it says something, something, and then it says rises, and then it says one in 25 or uh, some such. And you can see from uh, these, and if you look down the middle line, you can just see where it says rises, and then it says falls just here as well. So he's looking at the, uh, the slope. Now he's doing this with a level. And uh, this is the level and the level of sophistication, the, the, the level of sophistication that uh, they were getting to at that time. And this was the first time that proper levels were used on roads, certainly in Scotland and probably in the UK. Other improvements that DARE organized as well. Um, the improvement of uh, farm buildings uh, wasn't just an improvement of farm buildings. It was an indication 
that you were keeping your cattle inside or in a straw yard for the winter. And there you could catch the dung so that you could put it back on the fields again um, in the springtime. Now, this was um, fairly revolutionary. And the implication is not is that you don't just have dung going back on the fields, but you also have a rotation of crops and things like turnips. And certainly uh, Dare in uh, some of his, um, in some of the books, uh, is certainly at the forefront of turnip agriculture in the stewartry. Uh, this is the Borland Burn, uh, just on again back on the Borland map, uh, just north of Kukubri, and um, on the left-hand side, soft, sleechy sands uh, of the River Dee, and you can just make out um, in these vignettes the hatched lines, which is the current embankment, and the um, use of that embankment meant that all the farmland there is now is now in current currently um, uh, usable as as pasture and arable cropping land and that obviously wasn't the case when this map was done in uh, 1795 <coughs> again it was it was dares um, push to get this done that um, uh, meant that it was Mike's mentioned all the forestry stuff, so I'm not sure I'm going to mention the forestry stuff. Uh, but what I would like to say is that when we get into millions of trees, we're not just talking about plantations, we're talking about hedging as well, which is uh, a crucial aspect of enclosure and uh, making uh, uh, new fields. And the making of new fields means that you can have proper rotations as well. And this, I don't know who did this plan. I don't know um, uh, a proper date for it, but it must have been after the um, bridge over the D was made, uh, the Telford one. And uh, so must be, let us say 1810 or, or something of that era. Now what you've got, are all the fields laid out, enclosed, hedged. You've got plantations. This is the kind of perfection that Dare was aiming at, if you like. Look at the new buildings uh, and the cattle yards, um, all these things. And on the right-hand side, you can see where the old road is going. And just at the top of the screen, you can probably see the old bridge up at um, uh, Tongland. Um, so, as an example for what Dare was aiming at, this is probably this is probably it. Other things I'm just going to touch on these uh, was um, the improvements of um, uh, Kakubri itself. There was the new fueling plan that uh, Dare organized. And obviously, Union Street, Castle Street, St. Cuthbert Street, Milburn Street uh, were all uh, new with new houses going up alongside. And so uh, even though he was only around for, what, eight years or something working on the estate, and half of that he was spending jollying in Paris, um, he certainly made an impact on the place. Just for fun, I thought I'd stick this in uh, because it's um, <coughs> um, there's a, a copy at the NLS, um, but also because in, at the time we were talking about 1793-94, uh, there were actually shipwrecks uh, off uh, uh, Ross Island, a uh, little, little Ross Island, um, and uh, lives lost. And it was mooted then that uh, it, there should be an, a lighthouse on the island. 
I don't know how long it was before this thing got put up, but it certainly wasn't um, at that end of the century, I don't think. I'd like to finish up uh, just with a plea if anybody has any other maps. We do know of other ones. There's this one of Tate's that we saw earlier that I used, which is 1790. Uh, Tate did a lot of work over um, uh, in the east of the region, mainly in Annandale. Um, and uh, there's this one of 1776, which is, um, I see I've got the, um, it's wrong. It should, shouldn't be bar wood, it's bar hill wood. Um, but uh, the 1761, uh, 1776 one of the town, which was um, a Gillen one as well. It must be a Gillen one because it's got ships on it. Um, so if anybody knows of any other maps, there was another one I came across too at the back of the um, uh, statistical account. There's a, a small parish map too, which um, it'd be good to find an original for it. And just to finish up, I thought we would have a look at um, Gillen's work close up. Um, this is probably, oh, I don't know, this this particularly Randall with the boat in it is maybe an inch and a half or two inches wide. Um, so the penmanship on this is actually quite extraordinary. And around about, of course, is the black cloths um, that uh, uh, they were uh, memorializing uh, Lord Dare with. But thank you very much.